This caused great excitement at the time, but there were many possible sources of error in the observations, and the results cannot be regarded as conclusive. In subsequent eclipse observations, the results have varied between one half and twice the value predicted by the new theory. However, it has recently been discovered that among the strong star-like sources of radio waves, called quasars, there are some whose emissions pass quite close to the sun, as seen from the Earth, at certain times of year. The prediction of the new theory about the deflection of light applies equally to the deflection of radio waves. And by using two or more radio telescopes, 30 kilometers or so apart, it is possible to measure the deflection with great precision. The results agree closely with the predictions of the new theory. The third experimental prediction of the new theory has also been confirmed very precisely, although the experiment is no longer carried out in the way originally proposed by Einstein. According to the new theory, any periodic process which takes place in an atom lasts for the same time interval, wherever the atom may be. But a time interval in one place does not correspond exactly to the same time interval somewhere else, due to the hilly character of space-time which constitutes gravitation. The theory predicts that a periodic process which takes place in an atom at ground level will take place at a slightly slower rate than it would in a similar atom at the top of a tall building. The emission of light waves is, in effect, a periodic process. If it takes place more slowly, then it will allow more space between successive wave crests and so produce light of a longer wavelength. At the time of the original prediction, a terrestrial measurement would have been out of the question, but in the last 25 years, new methods have been invented which make it possible to send light signals whose wavelengths are known with immense precision, and the predicted effect has now been accurately confirmed by many different experiments. There are many other differences between the new law of gravitation and the old, some of which have been decisively confirmed by experiment. One of the most precise of these is the time delay effect, which was not predicted until 1964, almost 50 years after the new theory was proposed. The reason for this may be that the time delay in question is no more than a few hundred millionths of a second, and the measurement of such short times has only recently become possible. The prediction is that it would take a light signal longer to travel from one chosen place to another if there is a gravitational hill nearby, than if not. In the experiments, radar signals, to which the prediction applies equally, are sent from the Earth to one of the other planets, or to an artificial satellite, and reflected back to Earth. The measurements are made when the reflecting agent is on the further side of the Sun, which acts as the gravitational hill. The results confirm the predictions of the theory very exactly, in some cases to within one part in a thousand. The above experimental tests are quite sufficient to convince astronomers that where the new theory and the old differ as to the motions of the heavenly bodies, it is the new one that gives the right results. Even if the empirical grounds in favour of the new theory stood alone, they would be conclusive. Whether the new law represents the exact truth or not, it is certainly more nearly exact than the old, though the inaccuracies in the old law were all exceedingly minute. But the considerations which originally led to the discovery of the new law were not of this detailed kind. They were of a more abstract, logical character. I do not mean that they were not based upon observed facts, but they were derived from certain general characteristics of physical experience, which showed that the old law must be wrong and that something like the new law must be substituted. In daily life, when we say that something moves, we mean that it moves relatively to the Earth. In dealing with the motions of the planets, we consider them as moving relatively to the Sun, or to the centre of mass of the solar system. When we say that the solar system itself is moving, we mean that it is moving relatively to the stars. There is no physical occurrence which can be called absolute motion. Consequently, the laws of physics must be concerned with relative motions, 
since these are the only kinds that occur. We now take the relativity of motion in conjunction with the experimental fact that the velocity of light is the same relative to one body as relative to another, however the two may be moving. This leads us to the relativity of distances and times. This, in turn, shows that there is no objective physical fact which can be called the distance between two bodies at a given time, since the time and the distance will both depend on the observer. Therefore, the old law of gravitation is logically untenable, since it makes use of distance at a given time. This shows that we cannot rest content with the old law, but it does not show what we are to put in its place. But we do know that it must be expressed in some law which is unchanged when we adopt a different kind of coordinates. It is the business of the theory of tensors to deal with such formulae. And the theory of tensors shows that there is one formula which appears more appropriate than others as being possibly the law of gravitation. When this possibility is examined, it is found to give the right results. It is here that the empirical confirmations come in. Even if the new law had not been found to agree with experience, we could not have gone back to the old one. We should have been compelled by logic to seek some law incorporating the relativity of motions, distances and times and expressed in terms of tensors. It is impossible without mathematics to explain the theory of tensors. The non-mathematician must be content to know that it is the technical method by which we eliminate the conventional element from our measurements and laws, and thus arrive at physical laws which are independent of the observer's point of view. Of this method, Einstein's law of gravitation is the most splendid example. The pursuit of quantitative precision is as arduous as it is important. Physical measurements are made with extraordinary exactitude. If they were made less carefully, such minute discrepancies as form the experimental data for the theory of relativity could never be revealed. Mathematical physics, before the coming of relativity, used a set of concepts which were supposed to be as precise as physical measurements. But it has turned out that they were logically defective, and that this defectiveness showed itself in very small deviations from expectations based upon calculation. We will now consider how the theory of relativity has affected the fundamental ideas of pre-relativity physics, and what modifications they have had to undergo. For purposes of daily life, mass is much the same as weight. The usual measures of weight, grams, ounces, etc., are really measures of mass. But as soon as we begin to make accurate measurements, we are compelled to distinguish between mass and weight. Two different methods of weighing are in common use. One, that of scales. The other, that of the spring balance. When you go on a journey and your luggage is weighed, it is not put on scales, but on a spring. The weight depresses the spring a certain amount, and the result is indicated by a needle on a dial. The spring balance shows weight, but scales show mass. So long as you stay in one part of the world, the difference does not matter. But if you test two weighing machines of different kinds in a number of different places, you will find, if they are accurate, that their results do not always agree. Scales will give the same result anywhere, but a spring balance will not. That is to say, if you have a lump of lead weighing 10 kilograms by scales, 